and welcome to another fantabulous episode of At The Bar Podcast. As always, I am one of your hosts, Mike, and joining me, moving up in the second week in a row, he's taking Jeff's spot as a co-host. It's a lateral move, but he's getting promoted because he's, his name's coming up second instead of third. At this point, it's a promotion per podcast, and I kind of like yeah. the way this is going, so I'm, I'm totally fine with it. Yeah. As always, that's Foxy Chris. <laughs> Fox Norris. <laughs> <Got none. laughs> Fox Norris. That's Chris. And then taking Chris's spot as a third guest, <laughs> or the third host, <laughs> uh, because Jeff is not here. He's a little bit under the weather. But we have a guest to make his, I guess, second appearance or third episode overall, because we kind of combined two. In the one episode and the two episodes, uh, or split, I should say, Preston from the Beer Chasers. What's going on, Preston? What is going on, everybody? So at this rate, Chris will be the main host next week. I'll be in the second mm-hmm. seat. I'll have to find somebody, I guess, for the third seat. Mike, I don't know what you'll be doing. Yeah, I, I will find somebody. Quit. I quit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be sick. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Always, always a good time. Yeah, man. So um, this is an episode that we kind of I wanted to do last week, but with Jeff's trip to Asheville, I kind of wanted to cover that before he forgot because we all know that was going to happen eventually. Love you, Jeff. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so this episode we got Chris and Preston, both experienced homebrewers, and we're going to be talking about the GABF results, the Great American P- Beer Festival that ended two weeks ago. About yeah, yeah, about pretty that. recently, mm-hmm. two weeks ago. So we're going we're gonna to kind of go over that and kind of go into a couple of notes that we each got and kind of discuss, you know, trends, uh, a couple of local winners here in Florida. We got, we got two breweries that won medals. So we'll kind of go through, uh, you know, kind of like a roundtable discussion, uh, kind, of the, uh, kind of episode here. So it's be really cool. So I'm going to go briefly through my notes and then we can kind of, you know, go from there um, pretty much. Uh, I'll put a link in the description of the, uh, the the winners. But category four, the fruit wheat beer, Blue Moon Mango Wheat took silver. I saw that, which I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah, Blue Moon took silver. Um, was that one that category they did seven? In, did they do that in distribution at all? Oh, or? I, I don't think we. we I don't, I, I've never seen it. I, I hadn't seen it either. Um, I didn't know if that was one of those things that like it was maybe a seasonal kind of aspect or. Yeah, um, I haven't seen. Press, have you have you seen the mango wheat? No, that would definitely be new to me. Just the, the typical, you know, offering out here. So it might be something maybe a little more local out at the uh, the brewery or. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, category seven field beer, which I'm gonna go to Preston once I'm done with the with the the winner here. Uh, it had 92 entries. Local brewery for us in Florida, Copper Tail. Their slam piece took silver. So there if, you go. Uh, Preston, what does field beer mean to people who don't know like myself? So field beer essentially is just a beer that uses uh. Uh, vegetables and the adjunct, the mashed, kettle, primary, secondary, fermentation, pretty much anything obvious, you know, ranging from, from subtle use to, to big use, but pretty much just using uh, vegetables and that adjunct there. So, yeah. Cool. And Chris, have you ever done that kind of like vegetables in your beers before? or? Um, I've typically done them in like secondary. So, I mean, with, with what I'm looking at here, it's, it's essentially a cucumber Berliner Weiss, um, which sounds amazing. Um, but I've, I've never done really anything outside of, you know, just maybe adding it to the boil or to secondary, but putting them in the mash be a little bit different, be kind of interested to see how that would affect the flavor profile, you know? Yeah, true. So going down the list here, category 31, fruited wood and barrel aged sour beers. BJ's restaurant and brewery took gold (laughs) with their cherry tart. (laughs) Dude, they actually, they cleaned up pretty well this year too. I don't know if you look through some of the other ones. I mean, they're popping up on, you know, some silver and bronze throughout the, uh, Throughout the entire list, too. It's not surprising either. You know, I've, I've talked with uh, the general manager at the local BJ's here about beer. Unfortunately, because they're a corporate entity, they won't go on uh, my show. I mean, maybe you have a little more pull being the number one podcast in Orlando. But um, <laughs> I, I couldn't have get them on. But, you know, they, they do take pride in their actual brewing. Like, yes, they are a restaurant. They, yes, they have kind of that great Chicago pizza. But they do take pride in their brewing. And um, while they may be kind of macro-ish, I guess, if you want to call them that, because they are all over. But... Um, they they do take great pride in what they craft, and um, he was he was happy to talk for like a half an hour about beer and just all the different styles, what they do. I know locally here they use Brew Hub, so they don't have a physical brewery here, but they use Brew Hub mm-hmm. like a lot of breweries in, in Lakeland. Uh, for any national viewers who might not know about them, they're just a, um, a a leasing space for brewing. So you know if you're a brewery and you want to up your capacity, there's this place called Brew Hub that's got a ton of equipment in there, and you can just kind of brew on it. So that's what they use. So 
Yeah, and I've I've, All right. I've rarely ever gone in there. And I've I've never had a bad beer, and and quite often I've had very good beers. I mean, like you can you can say what you want about the fact that it's everywhere, but you know they they're making killer product. So I would say they're better than a, a good handful of local breweries, yeah, <laughs> at least yeah, in yeah. Orlando. You know, <laughs> shout out to the uh, Tatanka Stout, man. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> Going down the list even more, category thirty six: the American style light lager in Germans or. German style light lager. Coors Light took bronze. So fuck you, Miller Light. <laughs> what category? It was category 36, the American style light lager or German style light lager. Wow. Well, like, it's one of those things, too, where we can, you know, we shit on the big guys until our faces are blue. But I mean, at the end of the day, there is something to be appreciated about replicating the same thing at, at that kind of flawless, uh, flawless way to do it on such a technical scale over and over and over again. Oh, yeah. So, I, yeah. I, I say the same thing. You know, I, people ask me about brewing, and I said, you know, anybody can kind of do it, but you really got to give those guys credit for the fact that they're pumping out millions of barrels of it. And, you know, I don't drink Budweiser a ton. I, don't, I know Mike loves Bud Light, but, you know, That's right. as, as long as the freshness date is within when they say, I've never had a Budweiser, Bud Light, Coors, Coors Light, not taste like the last time I had it, which is pretty impressive. So oh, it's consistent for sure. I've walked yeah. into a ton of breweries who have great beers. You know, um, I'll throw a couple out there: Cigar City, Funky Buddha, where you know you have it one year and you go back the next year. It's like, man, it's just not quite the same as it was the last time I had it. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, going down the list even more, category thirty-seven. I, I like to call that the college category. That's the American <laughs> style lager, or ice lager, or or malt liquor. Uh, PBR <laughs> PBR won gold. Coors Banquet won silver. Coors Banquet. Order that is this is a yeah, I think it's, it's the regular. It's the cores. You know, you have yeah, the cores light and then the cores. The original oh. go-to, yeah. The original. Cores heavy. Highly underrated. I love that beer. Cores original Order. for banquet. Followed by the uh, the craft brew alliance, technically with Widmer, um, with their their gluten tolerant lager, I guess you would say, or like low gluten lager with the emission. Nice. Yep. Um, so. Category forty three, the Dortmund or Mond. Dortmund, whatever. I'm, I'll get corrected. Or German style Oktoberfest. I know we were talking just before we started recording. Kona Longboard won silver. Yeah. Kalei, so all the available here took took that medal. At, at first, I, I looked at that and I, I forgot that it had the Dortmunder in there. Um, like with the Oktoberfest, obviously nowhere near one of those. But with the Dortmunder, I could kind of see how it would fall in those lines for sure. It is a little bit more of a stout kind of uh, lighter lager, if that makes any sense. To where it's a higher ABV, higher malt profile on it, but also at the same time very unabrasive, very well balanced. So yeah, essentially, yeah. Dortmunder is just a pale lager, kind of, mm -hmm. kind of around the, the Pilsner-ish, but I don't, obviously not quite as hoppy. But that's right. Uh, going down the list even more, uh, category seventy-three, the German style alt beer, which had fifty-seven entries. The brewery down the street are good friends of the show. Red Cypress wins silver with their deep roots. Yeah, man. So, hell yeah. So super congratulations to them, man. Yeah. It's really cool to see at least, yeah. you know, some local breweries taking home some medals. So I'm really familiar with alt beer. What exactly is alt beer? It's a it's like an amber, pretty much. It's like an, it's, uh, a German amber. It's it's essentially along the same kind of lines as like a cream ale or a coal store. It's one of the few like hybrid between lager ale categories. Okay. Um yep. so if you're if you're getting to the nitty gritty, I wanna say it's lager lager uh, yeasts at lower ale temperatures. Yeah, um, just with the, a little bit more specialty malt than you would find in a Kolsch. So, name comes from being top fermented, an older method than the bottom fermentation lagers. Yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I love the so congratulations to, to Ryan and, and Garrett at Red Cypress for sure. Yeah, man. Um, just I'm going on the list here. Go ahead, Preston. I, was say, I always wanted to mess around with that at the homebrew level, you know, to to do some of those things. Take a take a, a lager strain and, and ferment it, you know, really hot, or take you know an ale strain and, and ferment ferment it a little lower. It's just I get scared sometimes, you know, you spend all that time and money. It's like, I like to experiment, but with the yeast, I kind of stay pretty, you know, <laughs> just like, let the yeast do yeah. what they're supposed to do. And I, I've actually, I've tried it out with Bohemian Lager yeast a couple times where I've done um, both a beer to guard and a Kolsch on it. Mm -hmm. um, so that strain specifically, I know you can kind of do it a little bit higher up in like the 60 to 62 range. Um, and you can get kind of those cleaner profiles on some of those ones where you would expect some, some estuary profile on it. So. Right. If I'm not mistaken, that's the way a steam beer is made, too. It's either a, a lager at high temp or an ale at low temp. I can't remember. Yeah, essentially, they were doing lager at a higher temp. So, I mean, you could almost look at an alt beer as, as the more traditional European-style version of um, a steam beer. 
All right, I'm so, seven. Yeah. So uh, going down the list, we got I got two left in my notes. I got category 76, Belgian style blonde ale or pale ale. 61 entries. Wicked Weed took silver. So we yeah, talked about the last episode. So no I thought surprise that was there. Relevant. They won a category in a beer that wasn't a sour, and they're known for sour. So uh, go figure. But, dude, they make um, some pretty solid beer outside of sours, too. Their IPA is insane. Yeah. I've never had anything from them, but we will, Chris, very soon. We will. Uh, <laughs> that's right. And the last one, uh, category 91, sweet stout or cream stout. 71 entries, Duck Rabbit Milk Stout took silver. And that's, I was going to talk about that. Yeah, that's new to, well, I want to say new, but new-ish to, to Florida. Um, so, Maybe, yeah, I live available, you know, that one silver, so hell yeah. Now, that's one of those ones, too, to where, like, there, there's a few beers out there, especially if you've been in, in the in the beer game for a long time, you still hear about these unicorn beers. Like, like um, the Duck Rabbit was one of those with the Milk Stout, to where I had heard from multiple people that have been up there, like, you got to try that, you got to try that. So it's just kind of cool to see it reaffirmed on some of the medalists here. So, yeah. yeah, I've had it once before. I just can't quite remember any tasty notes from it. I can't remember if it was sweet or roasty or anything like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. So before we go into what we're drinking, uh, so the IPA had the highest number of entries with 312. That's pretty typical. The, yeah, um, yep. And the, it's good seeing these because you know, like the trend on the you know the professional level of what they're really making. Uh, the Dipa Imperial IPAs are second with 211, mm-hmm. and the big surprise coming in third is the American Strong Pale Ale with 169. Really. Those are the top three categories in terms of a uh, number of entries. So, uh, yep. And I think the lowest had like 10. It was like the pumpkin squash category had like 10 entries. Yeah, they, which I was going to – go ahead, man. Yeah, they, they split these categories out kind of weird. You know, the competitions I'm, I'm submitting to are generally 30 categories or th- 35 at most if they include some ciders and meads and stuff like that. So it seems like they take some of the uh, BJCP categories and kind of maybe break them out even a little further than that. Yep. Yep. So that's that's pretty much my notes um, on that, and then you know we can kind of start the discussion. The little bit of the discussion now. Uh, once I find out what you guys are drinking, because I know Preston has something special. He's uh, uh he's uh, drinking yeah, now. Yeah, I don't I don't know about special per se, but um, it's what special. I have today for us is a Aventinus uh, Weizenbach. Um, and I guess it's kind of special because I I brewed a beer. I don't want to call it a clone, but it's highly inspired by. Um, it's something I wanted to brew for my work. They allowed me to brew for them maybe once or twice a year for like their summer party or for a winter party. And uh, this year we just weren't quite sure when we were going to be able to drink those beers. So I brewed a mango pale ale, so something kind of fruity and a little bit hoppy. And then I wanted to brew something slightly darker and sweet for people who might not like hops. So I went with a Weizenbach. It's a style I've always wanted to try to brew, and I figured it fit the bill. So um, look through Brewing with Wheat, and they had some really great information there from Aventinas directly. And... Uh, Pretty much mimicked that recipe, but tweaked it a little bit myself. I went a little heavier on the wheats uh, than I think the book would have recommended. But for the most part, stayed pretty classic. Double hops. Uh, no surprises there. You know, it's half Bach, half wheat. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'm drinking. Two of them. So how did, how did it turn out? Well, let's give it let's give it a side-by-side. So color-wise, looking at this. Um, you can break it down. Beer chaser oh, style. <laughs> it, it's pretty damn exact. I mean, I mean, mine is just a little less red in hue, but, I mean, it's – Damn no, near. that's pretty spot on, man. Yeah, that's pretty spot on, yeah. Um, the head, I mean, looking at the head here on the two of them, if you guys can see, exact yeah. head, exact identical. Head Retention-wise, yeah. yeah, it's pretty much identical. So, so the smell on this, you know, it's obviously, um, it's got that nice box sweetness, but you get a little bit of the wheat kick as well. Mm-hmm. Actual Aventina, so I'll smell mine here. Similar, but, but not as strong. So mine's a little weak in the smell compared to theirs. Theirs just has this big, robust multi-character and this you kind of have to fish for it smells a little weak in there if i had to rate on the beer chaser scale i'd give the the appearance obviously i'd say you know four or five out of five and it's it's exact exact on the smell sure. i'd probably give mine a 2.75 it just misses the mark a little bit uh so the taste cheers ah that's so good man i, I love weizen box the best of both worlds again you get some of that wheat bite you get some of that sweetness you get a nice little clean crisp pop nothing uh too bitter to balance it. Uh, go with mine then. Cheers again. Cheers. Cheers. Similar again, just like in the smell, it's a little less pungent than theirs. 
Um, it doesn't quite have that big punch of meaty maltiness. I mean, the, the flavor is similar, but it's just not there in strength. It'd almost be like, if I compared it to maybe like Winn-Dixie's steak sauce compared to like A1 steak sauce. It tastes very okay. similar, but you know, the, the Winn-Dixie one's going to be a little thinner, not quite as robust, and I, I would say this yeah. is here. Um, the mouthfeel, uh, mine's just a little weaker. It doesn't quite have the nice thickness and body of theirs. Um, on the taste, I'll give it a three. I think it's in style. Meets it. It's definitely not as good as the original, but it's in style. Uh, mouthfeel, 2.75. Needs a little more thickness to it. Um, I, I can't recall if I did a, a water treatment of this one or not. I know I've been I've been playing around with that a little bit now, trying to see if that can give me some extra points. But that's always tricky, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I keep it pretty simple. I either go for hoppy, neutral, or malty. I don't I don't mess around mm -hmm. too much with trying to replicate the, the Dortmunder River of Germany or anything like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I go and look at some some examples, and I kind of see what's malty, what's neutral, or hoppy, and depending on the base beer, if we go with that. Um, so, you know, uh, mouthfeel, again, 2.75. So, overall, I don't know, 3.25. 3 you know, it's, it's a little better than probably your average uh, Joe's homebrew uh, Weizenbach, but definitely some room for improvement, but drinkable. And uh, I have a couple of these that I will enter into a competition here. I just want them to age and relax just a little more. Uh, before I send them in, but we'll we'll see how it does officially. Maybe we'll touch back on it. Cool. What cool. the uh, what are the ABV set at? Because I know sometimes the Weizen box. I've, I've read that you know they'll they'll typically finish a little higher, and you'll kind of want to let like let them rest out a little bit. So yeah, this one came in, I believe, at like seven point eight percent. I was a little under on my my initial gravity. I think the the real beer is eight point two, which is what I was aiming for. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't quite get full attenuation as they did, so I ended up with like seven point eight. So it's a little under. It's still pretty solid, man. Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah, I'm happy with it. Um, it's a Weizenbach. I don't, I don't have any shame in saying, hey, try this Weizenbach, and people say, hey, that's not a Weizenbach, or that you know, doesn't taste good. So, mm -hmm. sure. Chris, what are you I know, drinking? I know, Mike, I got one no, in, no, the, in the box for you. You got one of these coming okay. to you. I, I hope I'm judging the competition that it comes in because like, I'm a huge fan of Weizenbachs. I usually hate wheat beers, but okay. Dupel Weizens and Weizenbachs are like the two that I'll actually go out of my way to, the, to find. So you got to say attention to Chris. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, attention, say to attention to Chris. <laughs> um, I should be able to sneak another two of these away. Again, I, I use them at my work party. They didn't all get drank. There's still some sitting under my desk, so I'm sure I could steal two more bottles and no one would notice. So. Don't feel well, obligated, but I won't turn it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I've actually I just went with the uh, the Tampa Lager tonight from Cigar City. I see. Um, yeah, like uh, it had been a long week and didn't, did a lot of events this week around uh, around beer and stuff like that, so... Um, wanted to have a few while watching a game today, but I didn't want anything big and crazy and, and too exciting. So I figured I'd go with this one. And they do, they knock it out of the park. It's, it's pretty much their, their replacement for Hotter than Hellas. And they definitely did a 2.0 and did it way better. So cool. Cool. Yeah, I think it's a, a little lighter, a little crisper. Has a little, little oh, absolute. Yeah. To it. Not nearly so, as like, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead. Do you think, man? Internet delay. After you, sir. Oh, no. Go ahead. No, finish your sentence. No, that was pretty much like it, it's okay. they they went a little bit more traditional kind of lighter lager style as opposed to that big malty bready kind of Municella style. So with this one, it's it's almost along the same lines as like um, I I would guess maybe a German Pils, but a little less hoppy. So right. my mm -hmm. only complaint is they left the copy for the harder than Hellas stuff on the back of it, so it's a little confusing. You're like, is this harder than Hellas? And it's just in a new can. <laughs> it's funny on. you say that. I'm reading it right now, and I didn't even notice that until you mentioned it. Yeah, so when we got it, I was like, oh, cool. So they're still making Hard and Hellas, which I love, but it is definitely a retool of the recipe. It's just if you read that and you're a fan of the old beer, you might get excited and find out that it, it is a little lighter, a little crisper. Still good beer, no complaints. But mm -hmm. True. I haven't had it yet, but um, Dude, check what I'm out. drinking is uh, my buddy is uh, travels for his job and brings me back beer. So he brought me back Bryson City Brown Ale from Ash, uh, Bryson City, North Carolina. That he got from... It's actually, I'm sorry, Natahala Brewing in, in Bryson City, North Carolina. So he brought back, it's a 3.8% brown ale that he brought back for me from Asheville. So it's, you know, kind of like Chris, long weekend. I don't want to get too, too hammered, something light, full of flavor, digging it, liking it a lot. Give it a solid B if we were, if we were uh, grading it. But, uh, yeah, yeah and I got, a, I got a backup beer. I got nice. from Asheville Brewing, I got... Rocket Girl Lager, and I'll show you guys the can art. But oh, nice! I like that. Making it a little comic booky. Yeah, so, uh, sci-fi. That's my uh, yeah. So that's my that's my backup beer once I finish this one. So a little history. I'm talking. Yeah. Nantahala, that's the river up there in North Carolina. I actually, went white water rapiding down that river. 
pretty cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Hell yeah, man. Yeah, my uh, my wife's grandmother lived up that way, so they would go every summer, and that was always one of the things they do is go up to the falls, Anna Ruby Falls, or go out to the Nantahala River. So it's a good time. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So I'm I'm, I'm going to take a break from talking, and uh, I'll let you guys kind of take the lead here. <laughs> sure, man. Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> Sounds good, dude. So uh, same kind of thing, just going through the through the list too. Uh, but as far as some of the the winners. Um, Mike, you touched on a lot of the same ones that I was going to talk about as well, but um, EJ is being one of them to where like they they really kind of cleaned house, and it, it's it's one of those not to touch on it again. I know we already talked about it, but um, they make solid beer. Um, they do a lot of contract brewing, but at the same time, whoever's in charge of doing their brewing is doing a solid job. Um, obviously, wanted to congratulate the Florida Brewers. Um, unfortunately, we only had two this year as opposed to last year, where I think we did uh, fairly better. Um, but kind of going through there, were, there was, I noticed this year it was a lot less of the bigger national brands meddled and you seem to see a lot of smaller ones kind of pulling out some medals this year as well. I mean, obviously that's just going to happen with the fact that we've, we've bumped up from 2000 to 4,000 breweries over the last five years. Um, but there, you know, there's, there's a lot of them to where they were just constant medal winners year after year after year. And they just kind of fell off to the wayside. So I think that's the trend that we're going to keep seeing kind of as the years go by is that I'm surprised, but not really surprised because these smaller breweries have the capability to tweak recipes and to put more time into it compared to the bigger breweries that are trying to hit distro numbers and trying to put all these things together. So they're, I think, more distracted with other things going on okay. compared to the, you know, the smaller, the smaller breweries. Um, I know Fatheads did clean up as well mm-hmm. and they're, they're, uh, they're mid-sized. I know we get a, a, a couple other stuff down here in Florida, but I know they're they're decent size, but they're not huge. But I think that's where I'm not surprised 100% that a lot of these small breweries won. Um, but I think it's cool. I mean, it kind of shows you kind of the opposite spectrum of the, the of the industry of you know the big the big belly breweries don't necessarily own the quality as much as they claim. Yeah, I'd agree. It's definitely an interesting trend to think about, you know, as, as craft beer continues to expand and blow up, you know, I imagine that some of those guys are going to get squeezed out in competitions like this. And uh, I, I think we're seeing that right here today. Yep. Yeah, for sure, man. And, and honestly, a lot of them too, to where, you know, we, we can't just sit here and tell that we've had every beer on this list. It's impossible. But I mean, yeah. you know, just, just kind of being in beer for a few years, um, you know, kind of a fanboy of a, of a couple different beers or breweries or whatever it may be. Um, so it's just kind of cool to see a lot of them out there. So things like uh, like Bells with their Expedition Stout, they placed second in the uh, 32 Age Beer. So super excited for them to do that. Great beer. Um, yeah. Love it. Great beer. Especially like the longer you sit on that, that literally is one of those ones where like you take that first sip and it makes you stop and forget everything around you and just focus on what's in your beer and go, what the hell just happened to my face? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I had one of those before, and I have one I'm aging now just for that exact purpose. You know, I really want to see how it opens up over the next couple of years. Oh, it's great, I have, man. I have one too. That. It's uh, two or three years old. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And then you got things like the uh, the brewery. I've always been a huge fan of them out of California. Um, and obviously, like things like Mischief and Hot and Roth is one of my favorite beers from them too. So they did fairly well. I think they did like two or three different medals in different categories. Um Ridiculous. They're very underrated too. Oh, dude, they're horribly underrated, and yeah. and you know a lot of people pass them over because especially down this way. By the time to get over here, you know they're a little expensive. You you might be looking at anywhere from like ten to twenty five bucks a bomber, um, yeah. which can be a little off putting for some people who aren't really you know into figuring out what's in there or taking the gamble on it. But I've never had anything less than just amazing from them. Um, founders, um, they they came out with the the uh, ridiculous last year. And that quickly became my, my favorite beer from them. I'm kind of a little biased, though. I'm a huge Imperial Red fan. Um, so when that came out, like, that was my go-to as soon as, like, as, from the time I could get it to the time it was out of stock. Um, so they, they cleaned up pretty well with the uh, silver in the Imperial Red Ale category. Um, Duck Rabbit, like you talked about. Let's see. Um, actually, one of – so I don't know if he's still there. Uh, but there was, there was a, a friend of mine from years ago who actually worked in this area – Worked in the beer area as well in Orlando. Moved out to uh, Colorado. Joined up with Copper Kettle. They actually took uh, gold for their their blonde ale, um, or their Belgian blonde, I should say, for the other Belgian style category. 
Um, so it's oh, kind of cool to see somebody. Them. Yeah, copper cut like they they do some pretty solid stuff, man. Um, they're they're known for like a mole kind of uh, Mexican chocolate stout kind of thing. Um, but the only reason I know of them is because of somebody from our industry in this area kind of going out that way. Um, and just, uh, it's cool to see them kind of pop up on the list. Um, Allagash, uh, huge fan of them. Oma gang. I'm sure you guys are in the same boat with them. They've been a staple for introducing, I don't know about you guys, but definitely myself into Belgian beers. So it's kind of cool to see them come up with their wit, um, knowing the history behind that one. Um, and then I would definitely say the best name for a beer that I saw on the list. <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys were looking for, through. Obviously, you get like Schwartz beer, so black lager. Um, so the beer was called Once You Go Schwartz. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so clever clever wording on that one. But uh, yeah, those are some of the ones that jumped out to me, man. Um, as far as metal counts for states and stuff goes, you, you would obviously think that the, the ones that pop into mind California cleaned with 68 medals um, Colorado cleaned with 38 North Carolina did really really well with 17 so those are you know obviously some of the beer meccas that a lot of people think about right off the top of their head um, so those ones were, were really really high up in Florida unfortunately only at two now but you know we're, we're getting there you know, a, lot, a lot of people claim Florida to be like the number three craft beer destination anymore you know with all the great breweries Funky Buddha Cigar City and the mm-hmm. explosion you know I guess number one or or two, maybe interchangeably, depending on you ask, California, Colorado. But uh, North Carolina is definitely stepping their game up. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff going on up there. I hear a lot of uh, new breweries, and, and, you know, looking at this competition list, you know, they, they score pretty high. Oh, absolutely, man. And they and I was talking to a friend of mine who actually lives up there, um, just kind of seeing if uh, – who's actually in the beer industry up there too. So seeing if, you know, maybe it's kind of been a shock to them or if they were expecting that. And, and they've been apparently very humble. A lot of the breweries were just kind of one of those, like – they're just kind of honored to be able to have that ac- or that accolade and that acclaim, um, and just kind of keeping their head down and trying to keep to the grindstone on it. So that's 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 cool, yeah. Yeah, man. I, I mean, also, it also everything's with an asterisk because you don't know what breweries entered what. Like maybe Due South didn't enter in, maybe Funky Wood didn't enter in, maybe Cigar City. So you know, it's it's a good representation of what what good states are doing, but also not accurate because you don't know who entered or who didn't enter. That would be real interesting if they did release that list. I'd like to see that. I would like to see that too, yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely, um, man. But it's one of those things where, like, this is, you know, this and the World Beer Cup, these are the competitions if you're a, a sure. professional brewery. You know what I mean? It's not like you, you miss out on this. If, if, you know, you got something lying around, you might throw it in. No, you're, you're putting your, your best foot forward. You're sending in the ones that you're most proud of. So it, it'd just be kind of interesting to see, you know, maybe what local breweries actually sent in, so. Yeah. That's really interesting, too. I don't think they do, like, a, a homebrew category, but they do, like, a pro-am version, if I read correctly. It's, like, mm-hmm. the pros will brew with some, like, amateur brewers, and they hand it out, uh, if I'm reading here, something like 91 entries, and they, they, they have a, a gold, a silver, and a bronze for the pro-am, so that's kind of neat. I don't- yeah, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's good. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think two medal winners is a good and accurate representation of Florida craft by any means. Yeah. Oh no, I, I wouldn't say that that like it, it indicates that Florida's behind the time or anything like that because trust me, I, right. I fully stand behind a lot of the bruises I've already done on a lot of the other ones. Sure. But yeah. Um like it's just it'd be it'd be kinda cool to see us up in those double digit ranges from time to time. Um so hopefully next year we, we fare a little bit better. And and Preston, you can kinda talk about the same thing where, you know, mm-hmm. these these comps, yes, they are kind of a, a, a grading on the on the, the quality of the beer and the technicality of the beer, but at the same time you know, it really might fall into, you know, what beers you're up against at that moment in that flight, um, yeah. how well or strategic you were in placing certain beers within certain categories that maybe they yeah. weren't the same ones you intended to brew, but maybe they fit into this one a little bit better kind of thing. So, yeah. you know, there's a lot of variables that either work for and or against you in these kind of competitions. So, yeah. Especially if you start using adjuncts and vegetables and stuff like that. Um, recently, we had the best Florida beer competition here, and I entered mm-hmm. some beers into that that uh, category was a spice vegetable uh, category, and there was like 40 entries. It was, you know, one of the higher entry lists, and it was uh, for my pecan vanilla doppelbock, which, Mike, have you had it yet? I know you have a bottle of it. <laughs> I have both of them, and I haven't opened them yet. <laughs> so that one actually I want, I, want to, I want to save it for not just me, but like to share it with what yeah. you're about to go, you're about to, t- to say. I'll make them open it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, <laughs> me, Chris, get drunk. And, you know, it, it made it to the second round. But like you said, you know, in that category, I could have maybe entered that just as a Doppelbach 
with the pecans in there. So as you mentioned, like really being careful of what category you enter it in. I know our, our good friend Will, who may or may not be listening, he entered a a smoked beer or into the smoke category. He had a um like a campfire beer, what do you call it? A, a s'more stout that had just a hint of smoke. And because it had smoke, he entered it into the smoke category. Well, the reality is it had a quarter a quarter ounce of smoke malt in there. And it was you know, much more of a chocolatey, stouty beer with, with some smoke. And because of that, it, it didn't score as well because they were looking in the smoke category and it should have been sure. smoke forward. So, you know, to what Chris is saying, it's, it's definitely got to be careful what, what category you enter. And, you know, like he said, depending, there may be four judges judging all 30 beers and the four you're up against, you might have beat four other ones from a different flight, but because you're on this one, you didn't qu get quite as far. Mm hmm yeah. So, uh, press, you get a chance to uh, now continue on with your uh, your beer, your homebrew. Oh, you want to keep going? All right. Yeah, I, uh, want, I want you to tell our audience about your accomplishments. Ah, uh, okay. Well, to, to, to shoot my own horn here, beep beep. Hello. Um, uh, I did hey, bus beep. driver. Hey, bus driver. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 that's that shit again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will get going. I, I wish I could tell you which which beer chaser episode that was. Uh, I know it was one of the Al Gash. Um, yeah. So yeah, I did enter some beers in the great uh, best Florida beer competition. I entered my peanut butter chocolate stout, which ended up scoring like a 27, so a little below average. Um, got some pretty good feedback on that one. I entered my Oktoberfest, which won silver medal. So very happy. Congrats, man. That's awesome. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Um, not a super heavy category. I think there were six or seven guys in there, but you know sometimes that's the luck of the draw. And either way, I was uh, second place out of the seven that were there, so I was happy with that. Um, I'm still my own worst critic, you know. I definitely have some, some feedback for that one on myself. I'd like to make it a little more malty, a little more uh, uh, German Marzen style, you know, not, not so much like the Fest beer kind of lighter, but a little more malty. Um, mm -hmm. Also entered in my Doppelbach, my just regular straight Doppelbach, which also won silver medal. Congrats. A, a, a which second I have. Medal, which he does have. And then I also entered the Pecan Vanilla Doppelbach, which made it to the second round but did not medal. So I don't know what place it was, they don't tell you, but uh, didn't make it to the top three. Uh, the interesting thing was, you know, talking about some of these competitions, and you could probably see this in the Great American Beer Festival as well, is the feedback you get on the beers sometimes can be quite contradictory. So you, you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt and you look at it in the law of averages. You know, some of the feedback I got on the pecan version about the base Doppelbach was different than I got in the regular Doppelbach version. You know, <laughs> some, some said it was thin, some said it was too thick. You know, there was some, some contradictory stuff. So you got to take it with a grain of salt. You know, it, it is a... Uh, human-based judging competition, so there's going to be some room for for human error there and, and opinion and subjectiveness to to your palate, and you kind of have to go into those competitions expecting that. But, but yeah, super excited. That's the the third silver medal I've won this year, so I still haven't got the gold. Um, I, had, I had a silver medal for my Belgian wit at the uh, uh, the, the summer competition, Orlando. I can't remember what it's called right now. They, they Sunshine a, Challenge. Yeah, Sunshine Challenge. Exactly. I had a, a silver <laughs> for my Belgian wit. So. Uh, I'll definitely be re-entering that one next year with a, a couple tweaks and adjustments, and I'll probably be continuing to try to uh, evolve this Doppelbach and do something that can get a gold medal. And um, I know I've been close on a couple other Belgian beers I've done. I've had a Belgian double that made it to the second round. I had a Belgian triple that scored pretty highly in Mad Monk. So um, I'm on the cusp of some greatness here. Just got to keep tweaking these and keep plugging at it. And you got but, it, man. Yeah, it's definitely cool. You know, it's great to get the feedback and to. Uh, you know, to see your hard work kind of pay off and to let you know you're like, you at least you're on the right track because I was at a point where I almost gave up. You know, I, I started home brewing and I made some stuff and I had great ingredients and I had a pretty good mentor, but it just wasn't to my quality. Um, then I met Matt Jaleski at Mesquita County Brewing and, and he really is responsible for, for turning it around for me. I mean, he's just been the best homebrew mentor you could ever ask for. You know, I I ask him ridiculous amounts of questions and repeat questions three, four, five, six times, you know, just to make sure I understand something correctly. And he's, he's always been great. You know, I, I feel like I annoy him sometimes, but, uh, you know, thanks to Matt. And I'm hoping he's listening or, or watching, you know, um, and he better. our shows. Yeah. So he, he's been instrumental. And ever since I've been talking with Matt, um, the beers have just kept getting better and better. Good, man. Yeah. Uh, not to go too off topic, but uh, yes, last, well, Yesterday was the uh, Windermere Craft Beer Fest, and uh, both me and Chris were there. And yeah, uh, Chris, I, met, was. I, I dragged Chris to the uh, Mosquito County tent and uh, forced beer upon him. 
It's rapid. <laughs> and, it, and I was totally okay with it until you sent my buddy back with that cider. <laughs> not that it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing bad about it. I'm just not a cider guy. So you tell Chris, like, this is for him. <laughs> uh, no, it was funny. As soon as he handed it to me, it was just like, uh, he said this was for you specifically. And I just looked at it. I was like, that's cider, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I take it yeah, out of cider. Not a big cider guy. It's just it's something I've never really got into. Yeah. But. Cool, man. Was, yeah, was, I, feedback was good. Steel County killed it, though. Yeah, oh, dude. Of course, dude. Hell yeah. I cannot just, wait for those guys to get their damn brewery open. I, I know it's expensive to get that equipment, but for. For F's sake, man, get it going already. We, we want your beer. We want it, you know, worldwide, spread out. Mike, do you know what size system they're going for? Or? No idea. Okay. No idea. I'm just always curious. Chris would probably know, know that more than I would. I don't think Matt yeah, I th- told you. I can't remember, you know, exactly how big they're going, if it's seven barrel or, or three barrel or something like that, but they're definitely looking to go, go big. I know they're they want a distro. I know that. They're definitely going to oh. go distribution okay, cool. beer, yeah. mom and pop shop where you can come and have a couple cool little beers like they're definitely looking to do the real thing i just know they're they're waiting for the right you know uh finances to come through you know it, it, sure. it's super crazy expensive it, it's a half mill if not closer to a mill to open up you know a nice seven barrel brew house and location brick and mortar and all the equipment you know so i yeah, mean so for two guys you know who are uh not making a ton of money to you know, mortgage your house and, and that kind of stuff for business loans it's a little scary so i think they're just looking for some some good angel investors or some people out there who believe in them to uh, help get them to that next step. And, and that's smart by those guys. I, I definitely um, agree with that, especially as we talked about before. You know, we might be seeing the bubble burst here pretty soon. They do have yeah. great beers. The but bubble. Yeah, they got great beers, but it still doesn't guarantee they're going to be successful and get out there and market correctly and, you know, be able to uh, swim through all the, the garbage that's out there and try to be the shining star uh, of that area. I mean, they, their beers do, honestly, were, oh, man, they were really good. Really, really good. They always are. Yeah, they they were oh. always pretty. Yeah, they they were all pretty solid, man. Especially I think for, for they were the best table. table. Yeah. A little. I mean, there's people bias, coming up saying. There was people coming up saying, "Yeah, these people down the, in the end told me to try your your beers," so they were getting a lot of traction. It's always a positive. So, um, yeah. So Preston, what you so, what you find in the uh, GABF results? So you obviously. Right, some of the stuff we've already talked about, you know, definitely wanted to touch on the, the Florida winners. So congratulations to those guys. Always great to uh, see local Florida beers uh, doing great in those competitions. Um, I skimmed the list. Again, there, there's just so many categories. It's hard to really digest all of that. But one of the, uh, I don't want to call it the surprises to me, one of the categories I care about is kind of the Belgians. I looked at the dub- doubles and quads and um, looking at the triple there, Allagas triple won, won the gold this year. And I know both uh, you and I have reviewed that beer and – I don't remember coming away from it thinking it was a stellar triple. Correct. Um, I agree. Yeah. Apparently, you know, the Great American Beer Fest judges seem to think so. So it's always interesting. And it's not to say just because a beer is rated highly, you know, 4.75 out of 5 on a tap that you can't think it's a, a 3. You know, Mike and I do that quite a bit. We take these five beers and we're just kind of like, eh, you know, is it hype? Is it – do we just have super picky palates or do we just have really – Prime example is Pl- uh, Pliny the Elder. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, well – it's a West and Coast. There, there's a few right. things with that too. Like, and, and Preston, you probably had some experience in the same thing where like when you're sitting there and, and you're doing the judging on some of these beers and you've got the BJCP guidelines right there in front of you, you know, it may not be the best triple you've ever had in your life, mm-hmm. but if it's hitting on every single, you know, descriptor sure. tire less than, yeah, you know, it may not be in your mind a 42, but, you know, based off of whatever is in front of you that you're reading, it's yeah. it's kind of in the same ballpark. So you end up scoring like, yeah. scoring higher than, than you would personally as a drinker. Um, but it's just, I don't know, it's one of those things, too, to where, like, obviously this is a different set of guidelines. Um, so depending on how, how they were expecting with their criteria as far as what you should be doing with the triple, maybe you hit right on point. I've had that one. I'm a huge fan of Allagash. Um you know, gold, I, I congratulations to them. I don't know if I'd put it in gold category myself, but, you know, it, it definitely hits a lot of the points that you'd, you'd think you'd be able to find on it. But Yeah, and I don't have the same information you guys do as far as, like, how many enter that category. I don't know if, Mike, you could look that up, but maybe it was a weak category. Maybe, you know, they didn't have a ton of entry, yeah. entries they had where, like I was said, actually 92. That's a, that's a good All chunk. Right. They, mm-hmm. they went through quite a bit. It. Hell yeah. <laughs> I'm not used to people being on point. <laughs> no, they're good, man. I mean, you when we had uh, me and Preston had that triple what like two three years ago when we like first met. Yeah. Uh, so 
you know, and then you got through a trade. So there's a lot of variables, not only, you know, time in, in our memories, but, you know, what happened in that trade process? Was it the freshest one? Was it not, you know, yeah. did it bounce a lot? I mean, there's so many variables from Very getting true. mail from, you know, so. You never know, uh, man. I mean, yeah, correct. Congratulations. I know Allagash has a great reputation yeah, amongst no. the community. But, uh, I mean, everything's subjective. That's the thing. Everything's subjective. So it's, it is what it is. But, yeah, you know, I skimmed through it, and nothing really jumped out of me again. Just, you know, congratulations to the Florida uh, Brewers, especially Red Cypress, uh, doing, doing big things in Orlando. We finally got some great beer up that way. Um, you know, our, our buddies, Bowegans, Red Cypress, I think they're definitely uh, carrying the flags. Uh, you know, Black Cauldron or Broken Cauldron or Broken Strings. Broken Cauldron, yep. String Cauldron Broken, whatever collaboration yes. it is. Um, you know, I think, I think they're definitely catching up, but they're, de- they're doing some good stuff. And mm-hmm. it's good to see Orlando is finally getting some, some quality craft beer. Yeah, those are my top three Orlando breweries. I'm just going to throw that out there. Nice. Top three. Yeah, yeah, nothing crazy. Just, you know, I was surprised. Again, I've never really paid much attention to the Great American Beer Festival, but I looked at it because we're doing the episode, and I was really surprised at how they broke out these categories. First off, again, there's 90-something categories versus a normal 30, so it was, it was a, bit mm-hmm. di- a bit to digest, just a little a little too much, I think. But um, and, and honestly, too, like I thought the same thing, but, I mean – Kind of thinking about it from like a, a competition organizer perspective. Imagine you know trying to lump in, oh, you sure. know, Imperial Red IPA with with Imperial IPA or with American Strong Ale and all those in the same category, and you've got you know three hundred and twenty three right. things, and all of a sudden you get three winners. Yeah, but you know there's going to be a couple of them that might you know come out of the woodworks and complain about the fact that they scored high, but they didn't medal and all those kind right. of things. So yeah, it's totally um, and, and honestly too, like you know, as far as you know, just kind of watching consumers buy and, and, and see, you know, how much cachet and weight that GABF metal has behind a brand when they're, when they're using that as kind of some, some fuel behind pushing their beer. Mm-hmm. Um, very few times do, do they actually look into, well, okay, so they've, they've got a, a bronze. Um, but in what it's, they just see the metal. They're like, all right, it's good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. So there, there were some on here where I, I won't name any names because, you know, I, I respect a lot of the breweries that are, that are on here. Um, but some of the, the metals that came out were, were a little curious as far as, you know, they market it as this style, mm-hmm. but it, it meddled in this style, which is right. completely contradictory. So you see some of those, too, to where, like, if, you know, if the, if the average person looked into it, it might be a little weird. But, you know, people are just going to see that metal shining and they'll be fine on it. So True. Yeah. So one of the, one of the things I kind of caught uh going through the list um in terms of, in terms of entries so obviously ipa is going to be the highest obviously 312 entries you know the dipa double ipa imperial ipa whatever but barrel aged or aged beers in terms of entries mm-hmm. contrary to where and, and coffee beer just for the record had 168 so the coffee beer is you know growing yeah. but categories one and two are both uh, American style wheat beer and then wheat uh, wheat beer with yeast. Thirty seven and thirty one entries respectively. Wow, kind of low, and that really surprised me in terms of you know wheat beers or aren't there's not a whole lot being entered in. Is that a sign of you know that that style kind of dissipating or and 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 going to the back burner compared to other styles like uh, for example, just going through like. Rye beer had 81, so it, it more than doubled Interesting. the entries. So it's just something that I saw Session IPA. What, you know, Jeff and me have claimed on the show that's been recorded is as a dead has-been style, Yeah, I think 118 so. entries. What does that say? Is it, is it coming back? I don't know. <laughs> I want to know what you guys think, though. It is a little weird on the American wheat scale to where, like, you know, a, a lot of the American wheats, I think, you know, when they started out on, on, on our side was – um, they were just kind of alternative versions of Hefeweizens and things like that, right? Um, so the American wheat category might be a little small, yes, but you know, you look at the, the German or the South style Hefeweizen or the German style wheat ale categories, they, they might have all kind of shifted to that area because with the, uh, the 74, with the South German style Hefeweizens, you got 111 entries. Um, with the 75, you've got the German wheat ale at 33 entries. So, you know, that's a pretty, pretty good bulk of, of what American wheat beers are. Yeah. Essentially. I, I'll go a step and say, you know, a, a lot of those might've been in the fruit category too, because fruit wheat is mm-hmm. pretty common. So some of those probably shifted over to the fruit wheat. Uh, and, and secondly, I think we're seeing a lot 
more like lighter styles, like your blonde ales are, are kind of coming to fruition, I think, into the American craft drinker. And what might have been an entry beer as an American wheat has kind of died off in favor of some of these other, you know, Kolsch's and, uh, you know, some of the other stuff that are, are lighter blonde ales in flavor than maybe an American wheat might have been. Because I don't think a lot of people like that wheat bite. You know, the wheat does really has like a certain characteristic to it that you either either love or hate. And uh, I, I think it's probably used as an entry beer for a while, but now we have a bunch of other styles there that are kind of taking over for that. Yeah, on that on that same note too, if you if you look at it, like the the two that you mentioned, the Pilsner and the and the Kolsch or whatever, you're looking at 115 for Pilsner, you're looking at 111 for Kolsch style. So it's definitely becoming a prominent like us taking our own take on it, whether it be traditional or kind of innovative. Um, I think maybe maybe the the palate of the of the nation is kind of maybe shifting that way a little bit more. Yeah, you talk about we talk yeah. about Bulger, and they have a they have a great Kolsch I like because they use a little bit of honey in it. They use a little bit of honey malt, mm-hmm. a little bit of honey, and it kind of brings this nice sweetness to it. And it still falls in that classic traditional Kolsch flavor with a little extra sweetness to it. But I'm like, yeah, it's weird how that how that happens. I mean, at least in Orlando, there's not a whole lot of Pilsners or Kolsches at breweries, unless they specifically like, for example, Rap is going right. to have. You know those styles because they're a German brewery. Your Belgians like Ocean Sun that does more Belgian beers are going to have beers like that. But those kind of like I don't know, quote unquote, all American breweries that kind of do a little bit of everything. You don't really see that kind of true style of a Kolsch or or a Pilsner. It's always that with a take of you know we had a Pilsner with mango or or the apricot or something. You never really see a true style yeah. like that. So with that many entries, kind of really kind of you know surprised me. Yeah, I'm see, so I love. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, man. Go ahead, Chris, go ahead. I see. I, like, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I go to a new brewery, I'll, I'll usually do like a flight, something like that. Um, mm. And I always make sure that I include their lightest thing, whether it be a blonde ale or a Kolsch or a Pilsner or whatever they're doing, because um, it's always like a buddy of mine showed me this. It's, it's the cheese pizza process. So, like, if you go to a new pizzeria, you try the cheese pizza. If they mess that up, then you're not going to have anything good from them. But if you go to a brewery, you try their lightest thing, and it has some sort of flaw in it or whatever, then obviously from there on out, there's something wrong. You know what I mean? That's just kind of the way I usually go with it. So seeing the fact that a lot of these these breweries are um, taking on these these very light, yes, but also very technically difficult to make beers is kind of cool. What's that? Yeah, there's not much to hide behind when you brew those light, you know, hellas kind of lagers and stuff. You, oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's not like you can just, you know, throw a bunch of hops in and kind of hide behind, you know, whether the bitterness or the flavor of the aroma or maybe some of like the stout roasty malts or kind of stuff like that. Um, this one is one of those, it's supposed to be clean, it's supposed to be crisp. And if you can't do that per- like perfectly, then people are going to pick up on it. So the fact that so many people are doing it is, is kind of cool. I respect that. Yeah, it's still crazy though to think the, the American wheat is that low because like I said, the, the competition I entered it and granted, you know, some categories like we're in the 30s and 40s, but still it's like American wheat. All of great American beer fests had less than 30 entries, and that's not even one per state if you really wanted to break it down. It's kind of like, sure, yeah. yeah, it's pretty nuts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then, uh, so yeah, I, I, I kind of was like, mm, what, what the hell is going on over here? Yeah, but um, another thing, a point is uh, Chili Beer had 112 entries. My shot thought was, I was expecting that many, but holy cow. It's and then, popular. yeah, I, I and think then, it's kinda- Go ahead. It's not a trend per se, but I think you know people are willing to experiment with those those spices and the peppers and. Yeah, I mean, true. It's it's it's. I think using chili and beer is is growing, um, and then another surprise is uh, category eleven chocolate beer, and 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 this has forty six entries, but that could be like chocolate chocolate, like a like a or, like the Samuel Smith's organic chocolate, or beer that has a little bit of chocolate or has you know. Maybe they, some of those beers went into the coffee category. So it's, you know, kind of like what we talked about before of, you know, organizing it and, and kind of what, what Will did was he has yeah. a little bit of smoke, but he put it in the smoke category when it should have been in the, the stout category. Right. Stout with smoke, not smoke with right. stout. <laughs> yeah. And, right. and what person was talking about earlier, I would sincerely love to see a list of beers that were actually submitted for all these different categories. You know what I mean? Just to kind of see, like, you know, with the chocolate beer category, the, you know, there, there might be, like, you know, a, a, a white stout or, you know, a, a chocolate, you know, milk stout or all these different kind of things that you could be using it differently. So it would just be kind of cool to see what's what's up and coming, what's performing well out of what could be a lot of interpretations of that style. And what I'd be interested yeah. to see, too, is, is in that list, 
how many are duplicates? Because I know that's something they recommend. If you're not sure what category to put it in, put it in both. You know, it's a little Dude, tough. I've done that. It's tougher for a home brewer, right? It, it, some people don't understand. They say, look, I brew five gallons. Like, holy cow, five gallons of beer? What do you do with it all? It goes quick. My family mm-hmm. likes beer. My friends like beer. My neighbors like beer. My coworkers like beer. I like beers. So, you know, it goes pretty quick. So uh, 48 beers go surprisingly fast. So to give up six or nine beers for the same competition, you know, it's essentially, you know, uh, a fifth of your whole lot or whatever. It's like it, it's tough to give that up sometimes. So, um, But I'd be interested to see, like, how many people put different beers in different categories at that Great American Beer Fest kind of level, which is kind of looked at the premier – you know, festival. And I, I've, I've done that too, um, to where like, you know, obviously with a homebrew scale, it may not be this, it's obviously not the same as like a professional scale. You're honing in all these different kind of things, but you know, like, and you might have experience with the same thing to where you, you'd see you, like, I've personally one time gone out and tried to brew a Saison turned out to be a pretty good interpretation of a Saison, but it also kind of tastes like a Belgian gold it tastes like a lot like, like Duval to me. So yeah. I put it in for two different categories ends up scoring like a 40 in a Duval, like in the Belgian golden category and like maybe a 31 in the Cezanne category. So all of a sudden you're just like, all right, well, I, I was shooting to make this. Didn't turn out as well as I thought it would for that, but it, it can might fall into something else. So the, the kind of like doubling down on, on certain beers, I've seen that be pretty, pretty lucrative for some people before. So I'd be interested to see if they're kind of doing it on the same scale. So, And, and to those home brewers out there who haven't entered competitions, well, I entered a couple – a 30 to 31 is not a bad score. 30 no. is it's, – it's pretty much good. If you look at the score sheet, that's a good beer. There are some flaws. There are some things that can improve on, but a 30 should not be, like, laughed at. That's a really good score and something to, to improve on. You know, once you get below that 30 is when you should start questioning, you know, you know, do I change the recipes or something in my brewing? Like, how can I improve this? But if you're getting 30s, like – you're on the way. You just need to make some additional tweaks. And it could be water profile. It could just be mashing higher, mashing lower, a little bit different grain bill. But you're you're close. I've once yeah. read that in in the homebrew categories too. To look, like the average commercial beer places anywhere from thirty to thirty six points. Mm-hmm. So any anything within that, I mean, you're 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 fairly comparable. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Somewhere it doesn't mean that's the best interpretation of that style. And I think 40, 41, 42, a lot of beers are winning at that number, 40, 41, mm-hmm. 42. I, I don't think there's many 50 out of 50 beers. Just like, Mike, I don't know if you've ever rated a 10 out of 10 beer on your show. I mean, it, it's maybe one or two. But, you know, you uh, reserve that. I've, like, yeah, I, uh, yeah. I've come close. A, c- a couple beers have I've gotten, you know, a 9, 5, a 9, 6, 9, 7. But no, nothing's – I don't think anything will ever be a 10. Yeah. It's supposed you know, to be that, that white whale. You know what I mean? You can't just find it right away. So, right. <laughs> so the closest is the funky blue French toast. <laughs> last no, just saying. Oh, the last was good too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, just to kind of you know, an- another bullet point. Uh, look at this list here while you guys were talking. I was kind of flipping through the uh, categories. Category eighty six, a brown porter, sixty one entries, which I think is kind of low, you know, considering everyone has. But gold was a chocolate porter. <laughs> Like, why wouldn't that be in the chocolate category? But, you know, so that's just proof that we're not complete idiots. Dude, it's it's so (laughs) subjective, too. I mean, like, it really depends on how the brewery wants to play their beer in this competition. Um, You might add cocoa nibs to that chocolate porter. You may not. You may, you know, double up on your chocolate malt profile, which may then put it in, like, a little bit of a sweeter thing. But depending on what else you add, that may be the most prominent uh, flavor, in, in the all the, the components there so you know maybe it actually works really well for a technically a, a brown porter um yeah. but you know it, it at the same time it may be a great brown porter but that's not going to sell well on a shelf if you throw that on the label you throw a chocolate porter on there all of a sudden it's moving off the shelf a little bit faster because you know we all know that people like that not not gimmicky but something a little bit more of an additive flavor profile to the base beer so that they'll see that and kind of move towards that a little bit quicker so it's it, it really is brewery subjective as far as what they're adding, how much, and, and what they want to say it is versus what they feel they can compete with it against. So, Sure. I want to know where the red-brown is. Where's the red-brown category? <laughs> <laughs> and then the gold-red. The golden-reds. Yeah. The gold-red. Weird uh, lens where it's kind of like these half categories. This brown porter. I've heard about that. It's just not something I've heard a ton of. I've, I don't see many brown porters anywhere I go. You know, I don't ever – see that it's very it's odd it's a, it's an odd label for so that. 
I'm looking at it here and just kind of based off the way that I've read the, the 2015 BJCP guidelines switch up a little bit. Um, it looks like brown porters are essentially a little bit more the English style to where you're kind of using a little bit more sweetness, a little bit more color additive as opposed to dark specialty malts. And then you've got the robust porter category 87, which may be a little bit more on the lines of like an American porter, a little bit more robust, a little bit more hoppy, things like that. So, Yeah, it, it's odd. They, they get really specific because on the, the complete left side where Chris just mentioned on the form, category 64, the English style mild ale. Mm-hmm. Or you, then right below is the ordinary or special special bitter, and right below that's the extra special bitter. So it's like nitpicking, I think. You know, it's well these every are little detail. These are all styles for sure, but it's just you know certain styles that just aren't as popular in the states. Um, especially with the fact that you know the English beers they they definitely pave the road for a lot of people getting into beer. Um, and there, there's a lot of styles that most people aren't familiar with in those styles of beer. But at the same time, you know, are you really going to focus on bitters and milds when when everyone's coming out with the new fruity ipa every week you know what i mean like it's yeah, not was, like everyone's pushing those so i was just gonna say most people don't understand there's a northern brown and a southern brown northern english and mm-hmm. southern english you know the americans just know brown ale and you might know american brown and you put american in the front of anything it just means it's a little hoppier interpretation of it but um you know that's interesting too it's just like i've never not never but i rarely see a brown porter i see mm-hmm. browns i see porters but rarely that yeah. brown porter. Um, and I know a bunch of us, if not all of us, are big fans of the uh, the, the Imperial Stouts coming in at Category 93 with 91 entries, which I th- I was expecting that to be a, close to 150. Because, yeah. um, I mean, what brewery now doesn't have some sort of an Imperial Stout? Um, even breweries that aren't even open yet, like Mosquito County. They yesterday they brought their uh, Snow Skeeto, which was their uh, Imperial Stout with coconut. So uh, I, I, I was kind of shocked. With, with that number, and then oatmeal with 61 entries. You know, the Imperials do take a long time to, to mellow. I mean, you can certainly drink an Imperial Stout six weeks after you've brewed it, but generally those beers come alive, you know, six, nine, 12, even longer sometimes. Uh, so maybe a lot of those just, they didn't catch the age right, and they couldn't submit them because they weren't quite happy with where they're at yet. I mean, I could maybe see that, and that's why I yeah. like them lower. But. Yeah. Or even then, like, you, like to that same accord, like, you, you kind of want to sit on them. You want to let them develop for a little bit more, um, which is why we see, you know, with Bells with their Expedition Stout um, in the age beer category. It, it probably could have, you know, could have done fairly well, in, or not fairly, I would hope, based on my preference of it, that it would do Should amazingly well in the right. Imperial Stout. But you got 91 entries there, and you got 40 entries in the age beer category. So obviously you cut your chances, like you double your chances essentially at that point. So yeah. I do my best as a brewer to to brew around the schedule so i know i like to enter the mad monk competition in deland every february that is a belgian uh specific homebrew competition so i say if i'm going to enter my belgian in any competition i want it to go that the one that's specific to belgian so i brew my belgians for that competition in february march to enter them the next february you know so i i kind of mm-hmm. understand the schedule of what's coming up and i know my summer beers that i brew i'm going to want to brew in march or april you know to let them be ready for the the summer festival and so. Sure. And I'll do the same thing with like IPAs and stuff like that too, to where like obviously, you know, the festival or not the festival, the competition's like three months out. You don't want to brew it today. So you, you started maybe a month later, month and a half later to where as soon as it's done, it's super fresh, has a much better, um, much better possibility of winning than, than something else would. So, right. Right. But one thing that I saw too that uh, I don't know if you guys caught, I don't see any other category other than category six, the pumpkin slash squash beer. Um, that didn't actually medal a gold or a silver. I saw that too. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and, and not to say that, you know, pumpkin beers just did that poorly because down below there, that category 10, there's a pumpkin spice beer, which seems to be a lot of what people are doing, which to, to between the three of us, 39 entries seemed very, very low considering everyone and their mom is doing a pumpkin spice beer these days. Yeah. Um, but the pumpkin slash squash beer, I'm assuming would be something to where you actually add said pumpkin or squash to the process at some point. Um, so that only had 10 entries, but out of those 10 entries, they, li- they literally only gave a bronze. So, uh, based on, from, from other competitions I've been involved in that, that basically just means that there wasn't something good enough to either represent a gold or a silver. I saw that oh, the, the best Florida beer festival too. There was a couple categories that they didn't have a gold. Mm-hmm. They had a and, silver and- and bronze, but. We uh, like I, I I headed up the uh, the sunshine challenge this year, um, and we had a few to where you know we 
we try to medal something no matter what. Um, but we talked to a lot of other competitions around the area to where, you know, if it didn't score above, you know, X amount of points, they just didn't score it or give it a medal. Mm-hmm. So, you know, your, your first place technically ended up being your third place just because they, they had a little bit higher standards, I guess. So, and looking at this list, it uh, looks yeah, that... separated out pumpkin spice beers from pumpkin squash beer. I thought that was kind of cool, though, because I, I like the fact that they denoted the, the differences between the two. Um, yeah. Because, you know, we, I'm sure we've all had something that actually had pumpkin and or squash in it. And it's a yeah. much different flavor profile than, you know, the average amber ale with pumpkin spices thrown into it that we see a lot of times nowadays anyway. Yeah, um, I mean, this brew with pumpkin knows it. It's no flavor at all. I could add mm-hmm. 10 pounds of pumpkin per gallon and it's not going to taste like a pumpkin beer. Yep. Yeah. That's what I think separates it from, you know, from our perspective of, well, ours, I think your two, not mine, of, of knowing how pumpkin goes in a beer and how much, you know, like Preston, you just said, you can add 10, gal- uh, 10 pounds, it won't make a difference compared to the consumer side. Like, oh my God, this pumpkin beer is so, has so much more pumpkin. And it's like, well, you guys know that they're using something else, but the normal craft beer drinker probably has no idea. It's all perception, man, and and, and honestly, yeah. times uh, at times like the the marketing and and just the the intelligence behind trying to tap into you know nostalgia or just these kind of things that people hold um, important to themselves around certain holidays, whether it be like Christmas. You see a lot of Christmas beers kind of in the same realm. Pumpkin beers was one of those ones where they weren't going to make a solid beer with pumpkin as a as a component. They were going to make pumpkin pie in your mouth. Like that's yeah. why they become popular. You know what I mean? Right. And that kind of ties into a lot of people's mental um, tie in with, you know, falls coming and this, that or whatever. So it's a little bit more of an emotional connection as opposed to, you know, the fact that they're judging the beer as far as what the beer is specifically. So sure. I, I brew one every year and every year I ump the amount of adjunct and I get nothing out of it. And it's almost at a point where like, I'm going to get a stuck mash and a stuck sparge here. If I add any more, I can't, mm-hmm anymore at least mashing with it you know maybe there's a potential of using it in the boil or doing some secondary stuff um but this year i even tried roasting it first to try to bring out some of the sweet caramelization i actually used butternut squash sweet potato and pumpkin i mean 10 pounds of the three together you know three pounds of each a little over and it still is just like if i didn't put the pumpkin pie spice in there it would just taste like this weird sweet beer you know it might not have been a bad mm-hmm. beer but it's not it's not a pumpkin beer. It's a pumpkin pie spice beer. Yeah. And I don't know where the so, point of no return is. Do I have 20? Do I have 20 next year? I mean, do I go crazy? Do it. <laughs> do it. I have 30 pounds of pumpkin, squash, and sweet potato on a 17-pound grain bill. You know, it's like. <laughs> That's when you just hollow pumpkin. out a pumpkin pie, just pour the beer in the middle of it, and be like, there's your pumpkin flavor. Yeah, Randall it. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess it's that time, fellas. You guys, any uh, kind of wrap it up here? Um, any any kind of last minute comments about the GABF, or uh, if not, uh, any kind of plugs, uh, pressing? We shoot it to you. Oh shit! First up, all right. Oh, you're the guest, bro. No, nothing, man. Like I said, there it was just real surprising. There was a ton of categories. It was a lot to sift through. But as you guys have professionally called out, you know, a lot of great stuff there. Um, very interesting uh, topics as far as just uh, how many. Uh, how many beers are entered in certain categories and some of the surprising winners. And like you guys said, uh, it's surprising to see some of the big beers that you would expect to see there. Some of the cigar cities, funky Buddhas weren't meddling, you know, some of your smaller breweries. So I definitely recap that and say that was surprising. Um, again, no, nothing, you know, super crazy. Uh, as far as plugs, you know, I'll have to, I'll have to cross plug here. Check out my show, the beer chasers. We're on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, Mike is pretty much the second running beer chaser. I think he's been on, more episodes than other co-hosts I've had. So Mike is just as much a beer chaser as he is a, and at the bar podcast guy. But um, other than that, thank you as always for inviting me on. It's always a great time. I, I love this format. Um, it's a lot of fun and appreciate the support. And thanks guys. Thank you, Chris, your turn. Go Orlando city. They won today. Yeah. Well, spoiler alert. You may have to cut that out. Like they're there. I, I often watch it later. So, um, <laughs> so Mike ain't post this thing for two weeks. You know that. What's that? Oh, fuck. I'm just playing. <laughs> so my day for two weeks. Though. That's a that's a very valid point. No, that's uh, you, dude. No, yeah, man. So I did, I just got, like I had a good time with this because you know GABF. You know, just because you have that medal, you know, it's not that it doesn't mean anything, but you know, 
it's something that a lot of breweries work towards. And personally, I've always kind of seen the GABF as like almost the Emmys of the of the brewing industry, if that makes sense. It's where you kind of you love watching it, love to see who kind of comes up, and it not only reaffirms some of the the bigger breweries and what they've been doing, and something you may already really be passionate about, and some of those brands, um, but also it, it's kind of a cool way to kind of check out some some new beers that that maybe you wouldn't have actually found out about, especially in your area with Florida. There there may be some people who've never heard of Cocktail, some people who've never heard of Red Cypress, who actually might go out and check them out now. Um, but I just I've always had a good time with it. You know, it's the best of the best for a reason. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much that, man. I don't really have anything else going on outside of, as far as plugging goes. You know, I'll be working some beer fest coming up and that whole thing. We got some some home brews coming up too. But other than that, that's pretty much beer in my life. So cool, cool. So uh, I just want to thank you, thank Preston again for uh, joining us. I mean, definitely want to have you on the show more often. When Jeff is not sick, but um, I mean, sick. Sundays at nine o'clock is, is yeah, quote unquote sick. <laughs> Chocolate peanut butter is now sick. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I like this format of us. You know, even though we're not next to each other, the fact that we can still have you on the show at you know any given point, pretty, you know, depending on our schedules. But you know, I, I want to have you on more often for sure. Um, I yeah, like this format. I- Works. The time frame works. You know, it's a good time. Nine, nine and ten o'clock. The, the the kid is down. The the day is winding down, and uh, with, with enough advance notice, like we can make it happen. I'm in the same sure, boat, sure. man. Literally put the little one down at like eight fifty. <laughs> good timing, but uh, yeah. So I, I give a shout out to the beer chasers. I don't know if I'm the second, but I'm definitely, if not second, definitely third. Uh, I know Nate's been on there quite a bit, but uh, check out the beer chasers YouTube. They do homebrew videos, beer reviews. He covers everything. He does a lot. Of, uh, Preston does a lot of Facebook Live uh, little things here, segments that are, are pretty neat and cool. And, and he talks about different things. So check them out. Uh, Chris and myself, it's, it's craft beer uh, fest season. So my entire month in November, every Saturday, I'll be at a beer fest I, minus Thanksgiving. Dude, trust <laughs> me, I hear you on that yeah. one, man. Yeah. So yeah, the, uh, the, uh, first, the first Saturday of December coming up. Yeah. 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 Uh, so um. I think two weeks from now is the Orlando Beer Fest. Uh, yep. I know I'll be there uh, drinking. Won't be pouring. Uh, yet last night was the Windermere. And then the first uh, December, was it uh, 10th, Preston? Well, it's December. We decided December 3rd. 3rd, 3rd. December 3rd. Me and Preston will be at J-Dubs in Sarasota doing some episodes there. So I'm pretty excited for that. So I'll be posting some stuff about it. I'm sure uh, Preston will. Uh, but definitely – Huge, huge, huge congratulations to Red Cypress and Copper Tail for meddling and representing Florida craft beer. Yeah, um, man. You know, especially, I know we're, we're close with Red Cypress, so Ryan and Garrett, man, congratulations, and all your staff. You guys killed it. So uh, I had a lot of Red Cypress last night, not going to lie. <laughs> but, um, as always, feel free to check us out on social media. We're everywhere, uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and this episode should be released uh, sometime this week. But we have some things in the, uh, in the uh, idea chamber. I, I want to start uh, live streaming the episodes in, a, in like a couple weeks to have some more a live, live crowd get that going. And, and awesome. it, puts, it puts you in the hot seat. So it, yeah. it's I've, I've done it both ways. And I can tell you the amount of work is the same. It's just one has a lot more pre-production. You know, if you're going live, you've really got to get it ready to go before you go. And then you do it. Oh, yeah. But, you know, doing it this way, you have a lot more post-production, you know. So you still have the same amount of work. You're just kind of shifting it to the front end versus the back end. But it's a lot of sure. fun. Put it on the hot seat. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Chris, what are you going to say? No, and just saying for anyone listening too, like definitely comment you know below and just kind of if there's something that you know we haven't touched on or something that you've seen kind of developing in, in the industry or you know what it may be that you'd like to see us kind of look into and talk about, just definitely put that down below. Yeah, just what he said. He said it for me. But anyway, uh, in the next couple of weeks, look for some live streaming Sundays at nine o'clock. So far, but uh, yeah, I mean it'll be it'll be cool to, to you know people to to talk and comment live and all that fun stuff. But uh. Once again, thanks again for uh, listening and watching, and we'll see you at the bar. Cheers. See you. See ya.